Hi and welcome back. In the previous video we made our game clear complete lines, keep track of the score and adjust the level based on the score. And now it's time to add some variability to our game to make it a bit more playable. Let's get started. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make our program spawn blocks at random x position and in a random rotation. We will also make the blocks spawn with a random color. As some of you might have realized by the number of times I said the word spawn, we will now modify the spawn method of the Tetris block class. Currently the X position of the block is set so that the block appears in the center of the game area. Let's use a random number instead. There are several ways to get a random number in Java, and we're going to use the random class. Let's create a random class object inside the spawn method. Let's also import the random class. Since the x position of the block is an integer number, we need to get a random integer number. To get a random integer number, we can call the next int method of the random class. There are two versions of the next int method. One takes no parameters, the other one takes one int parameter named bound. The bounded version of the next int method returns a random int value ranging from zero inclusive to the number specified by the method parameter non-inclusive. For example, if we call the next int method with 5 as a parameter, it will return one random integer number ranging from 0 to 4, 5 excluded. Because the x position of the block must be within the game area, it cannot be completely random and must be confined between the left and the right edges of the game area. We know that the left edge of the game area is represented by the number 0. So the minimum x for a block is 0. Now let's figure out the maximum x for our block. Since x represent the horizontal position of the leftmost column of the block's shape, the maximum x would be the width of the game area minus the width of the block. In other words, to randomly pick the x position of the block, we call the next int method like this. If you run the game, we will see that the blocks still spawn at the center of the screen. Why? If we look closely, we will see this wrench icon, which, as some of you might remember, means that the Tetris block class needs to be compiled, which we can do by pressing the Build Project button. Let's run game form again to see the blocks spawn randomly. Now, let's do the same for the rotation of the block at spawn. Since we have four rotations in total, we call the next int method like this. Or like this. And it seems to be working. Finally, let's give the blocks random colors as well. To do that, we first need to create a list of available colors. In other words, let's create an array of the type color and add a few colors in there. Now, in the spawn method, we can assign the variable color a random color from the available colors array, just like we did a moment ago for the rotation. And now we have our block spawn in different colors, rotations, and at different positions. Before we move on, let's make a change to the Tetris block constructor. Since we now pick the color in the spawn method, we don't really need to define it in the constructor. So let's remove the color setting part. Let's not forget to adjust the code of the game area class. We need to remove the color from the Tetris block instantiation in the spawn block method. Now let's add even more variability to our game by adding other block types, finally. There are several ways to do that, and you got it. Ours is not going to be the easiest. I do believe though that the approach we're going to take will be a good OOP practice. So what we're going to do is we're going to create separate classes for each of the block type. And we'll have these classes inherit from the Tetris block class. Before we start adding new classes, let's create a new package and name it Tetris Blocks. 
since we'll add a lot of new classes, seven to be precise. It's not a bad idea to keep them separate, otherwise it might get too messy. So now, to the Tetris blocks package, let's add new Java classes named L-Shape, J-Shape, Z-Shape, S shape. T shape. O shape. And I shape. Let's now look at the I shape class since it's the first on the list. Clean up the code, space it out, and have the class extend the Tetris block class. Please note that since our shape classes and the Tetris block class are in different packages, we need to import the Tetris block class. Let's now add a constructor to the I shape class. Now the Tetris block class has multiple private member variables, and we know that child classes do not have access to the private members of their parent classes. If what I just said doesn't make much sense to you, I recommend that you refer to the video on inheritance before proceeding with this one. Now we need to be able to initialize the shapes array of the Tetris block class to give the block its shape. Currently we do that by calling the Tetris block constructor when we instantiate the class in the game area class. Is there any other way to call a constructor? Yes, there is. Child classes can access public constructors of their parent classes. How? By using the keyword super. Remember we use the keyword super in the pain component method of the game area class to call the pain component method of the parent class. Here we use the super as if it were a reference type variable. To call a constructor of a super class, we should use the keyword super as if it were a method. And we pass this method whatever we would normally pass to the constructor. In our case, we pass an array of interrays that represent the shape of the block. What this means is, when the iShape class has been instantiated, its constructor will call the constructor of the Tetris block class and initialize the shape array. Now, this part might be a bit confusing. See, a child class does not inherit private members of the parent class. However, when we instantiate the child class, the resulting object will contain all instance members of the parent class, including the private ones. In other words, even though in the iShape class we cannot access the variable shape declared in the Tetris block class, when we create an iShape object, that object will contain the variable as if we declared it in the iShape class. Even if it's still confusing, that's totally fine. For now, instead of trying to make sense of the theory, let's focus on the practical benefits. Even though a child class does not have access to the private members of the superclass, we can initialize those indirectly by calling a constructor of the superclass. So what would the shape array of the I shape look like? Since it's just a straight line, it can look like this. And this is it. If we now switch to the game area class, and instead of instantiating the Tetris block class and the spawn block method, we instantiate the I shape class. Then import the I shape class. And run the program. We will be getting I shapes instead of L shapes. Now let's add necessary code to the remaining shape classes. So the shape array of the J shape should look like this.
For the L shape, like this. For the O shape, like this. For the S shape. Like this. For the T shape. Like this. And for the Z shape, like this. Now what do we do with these seven block types? We can put them into an array and have our game randomly pick one of them, what we call the spawn block method of the game area class, just like we did for picking random colors in the Tetris block class. So let's declare a private array of the type Tetris block and name it blocks. Now inside the constructor, let's instantiate the array, adding one object of each block type. We can't instantiate the J shape class because we need to import it first. In fact, we'll have to import all the remaining shape classes, which is sort of annoying. Instead, we can scroll up, delete the I shape part of this import statement, and add an asterisk instead. This will import all the classes in the package. And if we now look back to the constructor, we'll see that the J shape no longer needs to be imported. So let's continue instantiating the shape classes. Now that our array is ready, we can pick random blocks from it in the spawn block method using the random class. Now let's run our game to see if it works. And suddenly this program looks significantly more like a Tetris game. There are a few issues though, but before we fix them, let's look at what we just did. Here we instantiate an array of the type Tetris block. And in the array, we store references to shape objects. Wait, but arrays can only store one data type. We can't store a string in an int array. Right, we can't. But in our case, because all shape classes extend Tetris block, they're all considered Tetris blocks, and we can store them in a Tetris block array. This is an example of polymorphism, one of the cornerstone principles of object-oriented programming. Now, we have a few issues in our game. 
First, when we rotate the block, it might go outside the game area, which results in an out-of-bounds exception. To fix this, we need to check if the block goes out of bounds after rotation, which means that we need to make changes to what method? Right, the rotate block method of the game area class. So after we call the rotate method on the block, we need to check whether the left edge of the block is out of bounds. And if it is, we need to set the X position of the block to right, zero. Then we check if the right edge of the block goes out of bounds. And if it does, we set the X position of the block to right, to the difference between the width of the game area and the width of the block. Finally, we check if the bottom edge of the block goes out of bounds. And if it does, we set the Y position of the block to right, the difference between the height of the game area and the height of the block. Now, at the moment, we do not have methods in the Tetris block class that would allow us to modify the values of X and Y directly. And this is why NetBeans is yelling at us. So let's add these methods. And now our blocks never go out of bounds. Great. Now if you look at the eye shape rotation, you'll probably notice that something just doesn't look right. When we rotate a block, we change its shape array. And except for when the block goes out of bounds after rotation, we do not change the X and Y positions of the block. While it looks fine for most of the block shapes, it doesn't really look okay for the eye shape. Rotating an eye shape looks like opening a door viewed from above. The main reason I brought this up is not because the eye shape rotation looks ugly, but rather to practice method overriding a bit more. What we can do to fix the eye shape rotation is we can override the rotate method the eye shape class inherits from the Tetris block class. In other words, we can have a unique rotation behavior for the eye shape only. So let's override the rotate method inside the eye shape class. Now we do want to keep the functionality of the original rotate method. How do we do that? Right, we call the rotate method of the super class. And then what we do is we adjust the position of the block after rotation, depending on the width of the shape. For example, when we rotate an eye shape block from the horizontal to vertical orientation, we can move the block up and right by one. And when we rotate it again from the vertical into the horizontal orientation, we can move it down and left by one. Let's now write code for that. So if the width of the block is one, which means that the block is in the vertical orientation, we increase the X position by one and decrease the Y position by one as well. Otherwise, we decrease the X by 1 and increase the Y by 1. And now the eye shape rotates more nicely, at least to make it looks better. And step 6, complete. Another issue is that sometimes when we rotate a block, it rotates right into another block. How do we fix this? Remember we had a similar issue with moving the block. What we did is we added check bottom, check left, and check right methods to make sure the block can be moved in the respective direction. And we should do something similar for rotation. One way to approach this is to rotate the block, then check whether it overlaps with non-null elements of the background array. And if it does, we either adjust the block's position or we simply unrotate the block, effectively canceling the rotation. Now that you know how to fix this issue, try doing it on your own as homework. No, God, please, no, 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 no. No, no, I'm not kidding. And yes, I'm pretty sure you can do it if you were able to follow the content of this video series up until now. In addition to this, you can also try preventing the game from spawning the blocks of the same shape or the same color too much in a row.
We can do that by having the program keep track of the previous shape and color of the block. Alright, so in this video we made our game a bit more playable by making it a bit more random. Random is fun. We also practice using inheritance and method overriding, in addition to learning a bit about polymorphism. As we proceed with making our Tetris game, it gets more complex and more difficult to follow. So if you feel overwhelmed, don't worry, it's absolutely normal. The more you practice something, the less overwhelming it becomes, so I greatly encourage you to follow along and do your best to make sense of what we do in these videos. And we're done with most of the Tetris game functionality. In the next video, we'll add a leaderboard to our game to make it slightly more competitive. Looking forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.